We've been talking to some of the top economists in the world to get a sense of what the path forward for the global economy might look like. Today, we're speaking with Robert Schiller. He's a Nobel laureate and a professor at Yale University. Professor, thank you so much for talking with us today. I want to start out with what your outlook is for the U.S. economy right now. My outlook is uncertain because this is an unprecedented situation. We've seen a spike in unemployment in its suddenness, which is unprecedented. We're living in a new environment, for, for now at least, that suggests that people are changing their thinking, their assumptions, uh, and their uh, ideas about business. So it's a turning point. Which way it's turning is not so clear. You've been kind of known to predict bubbles and previous you know, imbalances in the system. Are there any areas where you see risks of bubbles or buildups in the system right now? Definitely. We have highly priced markets in the stock market, the bond market, and the housing market. Those are kind of like the three main asset classes, and they're all highly priced. Now, some people would say it's because of the Federal Reserve taking interest rates down, but I wouldn't blame the Federal Reserve because it's a worldwide phenomenon. So it's a, we're living through a period of high asset price. We, we have been. Uh, any one of these has, has a possibility of, of decline. I'm not saying it's going to happen. Uh, the, uh, all of these markets uh, could tumble uh, in the coming, coming months. What does that tell us about the housing market in general? I know you're one of the preeminent voices when it comes to housing. What's your outlook for that sector right now? The housing market has two important components, the urban component and the suburban component. We could also say rural component. They have different outlooks. I think that there is a danger that urban setting housing that means housing that people uh, took because they valued its location close to work and the amenities of city living may suffer because first of all, the employers may be allowing work at home this time and work at home uh, saves a lot of time and effort commuting into work. People might, they're, they're, they've had a trial run of it and they might like it. Uh, also the amenities of city living, what's nice about the city? It's good restaurants, theaters, museums, art shows. But if you're afraid of people because you think you might catch something from them in, in the next epidemic, then you may, uh, you may really think of that. It may color your whole feeling about the city and it may cause price declines. People won't be willing to spend a million dollars for a small condo in, in coming years if that's the way they feel. Not a certainty, but a risk. So if we see people moving out of cities in the in the next couple of years as a result of the pandemic, that could change the prices of cities, which are typically much more expensive. Yeah, because those apartment buildings in the city are hard to move. <laughs> you, you, could, you could ask someone to try to move a building out of Manhattan to the countryside, uh, but you won't <laughs> you won't find it feasible. So the prices will fall. Uh, that that is a risk. But it doesn't mean prices will fall everywhere. Uh, people forget that a, a lot of the value of homes outside of this central city is in the structure. And you can build more of them. The home prices out of the dense urban setting tend to follow construction costs. And so there shouldn't be any big movement uh, in those prices. Do you expect that there might be a longer term shift in offices and the way we work too? People actually actively don't want to go into an office right now. Now the question is how much and how soon will they get over that? Employers are already thinking about how to space people out more, but that's very expensive. Now one plus side is they may incur a lot of expenses in construction costs. It's the same thing we see at universities. The classrooms are too crowded, so we have to build more classrooms and spread them out. It might actually involve improvements in our GDP because of extra demand. But it, it could more likely go the other way, which is that people will just select online learning or they'll select work at home and we'll live in a much more dispersed world and more of our social life will be on uh, screen-based uh, social life. You are a professor at Yale. Do you envision higher education moving online mostly? What do you think the future of, of universities might look like? Yeah, so uh, this is uh, a difficult question. I, I've just 
completed teaching a course online. Uh, the question is, is this the future? The problem is people like a campus situation. They like to be together with other young people. And it, it's a human uh, desire. The uh, telephone was invented in the late 19th century. And some people thought then that this is going to be the end of cities. Uh, but it didn't happen uh, because people still like to get together. They like to be really together. They don't like to be lonely. They don't want to be sitting with a machine in a room. There probably will be more online learning in the long run from this experience. But I, I also think that it may disappoint in that respect. With unemployment now so high, will the labor force and the workforce look different going forward? I think there will be changes. This is uh, learning by doing. We're experiencing a different kind of world where it's we're all online. And uh, that will change the nine kind of jobs uh, that we have. So uh, starting a retail business may not be as good uh, at this point in history. Uh, but uh, starting a delivery service might <laughs> at this point. We're, we're seeing a lot of things delivered to our homes. That was a trend already, but this makes it even stronger. What would be your advice for what uh, younger workers could do to prepare for the future and the workforce of the future uh, or for unemployed people in general right now? Is there a silver lining going forward? Uh, I don't know the answer. I can tell you what advice I've been giving my students. You have to become expert on something, really expert on something uh, that that can beat the internet. <laughs> for, uh, and it, it helps to be doing people-oriented things. I've been saying that, but going into the future, we don't know what actually is, is going to happen. Uh, and uh, I'm worried about increasing inequality as a possibility in the, in the future that our society will have to deal with. There's been a lot of talk about how the pandemic has made inequality worse. Do you think that will continue going forward and what can be done to address that? Immediately, I think we'll see an improvement in uh, inequality is very high at this moment in history when the COVID epidemic is at its peak in many places. And that is a, a situation that won't last. So inequality will get better in the short run. But in the longer run, I don't know. The uh, polarization of our society makes it more difficult to achieve economic success. And prejudices, are, are anger, uh, interracial anger is, is stimulated, but we, we all have to try to uh, prevent this from happening. Uh, remember our friendship <laughs> with each other and our goodwill wishes for each other. One inspiring thing about the crisis, uh, the COVID-19 crisis, is that it has illustrated the heroism of people in, in uh, not in military job, but in ordinary jobs. People who deliver food or uh, healthcare workers, especially. And so there is a, a sense of uh, almost wartime uh, uh, spirit uh, of a community at this time. And it may lead to a politics that is more amenable toward measures that will help relieve inequality. Any advice you'd have for the people making policy, for policymakers, lawmakers, that could help address some of the fallout from the pandemic and maybe that longer term inequality as well? Well, policymakers have been doing uh, the right thing in the United States and other countries in that they're trying to stimulate the economy and protect people who are suffering the most. We don't want anybody starving. We don't want anyone hungry. We want to establish that we are a caring society and that will help build trust in each other. And this trust in each other is, is ultimately a spur to economic growth. Once we trust each other, we care about each other, we'll do the right things more often. I think of the, the Great Depression as a analogous experience when we had very high unemployment. It affected different countries differently. It, it actually, I think, produced in the United States a, a very good outcome. We established new uh, institutions that protect people, like Social Security or uh, insurance for bank deposits. And uh, it led to uh, uh, a lot of innovations that initially looked dangerous. They were replacing jobs, but it ultimately produced a stronger economy. Uh, so I, I think that the same thing might happen here again.